I'd like to welcome everybody here tonight. My name is Paul. I'm one of the librarians at Thomas Crane Public Library, and we're here for this really uh, compelling program, How Quincy Honored a U.S. Navy Hero, the story of Leonard Roy Harmon, uh, being presented by Dr. Karima Lewis and also co-hosted with Bob Damon. And I'm going to pass it over to Bob, but before I do that, I do want to thank Quincy 400 for helping to co-sponsor this event. And um, Bob, I'm going to hand it over to you. All right, Paul, thank you so much. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here um, in what is now a rich, almost full year long tradition of online programming with the Thomas Crane Library. Um, if you all have not been a part of or taken advantage of the programs in the past, um, just keep tuning in. Uh, the, the Crane Library does amazing programming on a regular basis here. And it's a real honor uh, for me personally to be a part of the program tonight. Uh, my name is Bob Damon, as Paul mentioned. Uh, I am a public historian, but I'm also the director for historic and heritage resources here in the city of Quincy. Um, and it's my pleasure to be with you tonight uh, for this program uh, to talk about Quincy's unique intersection with a young man from Texas by the name of Leonard Roy Harmon. And uh, to, um, my job first is, is to introduce my co-producer and uh, main presenter here tonight, Dr. Karima Lewis. Uh, Dr. Lewis is, likes to call herself a local historian, but she is an expert in African-American history and in particular colonial African-American history here in New England. Um, she is a professor uh, both at Emerson and Massasoit Community Colleges, uh, a proud mother and grandmother, as she reminded me I was supposed to say, um, and just an amazing all-around scholar. And so with that, I'm going to hand the program over to Dr. Lewis to kick us off tonight. <laughs> thank you, Bob, um, for that introduction. And thank you, um, Quincy. I always say Quincy Library and they correct me and say Thomas Crane Library. Thank you, Thomas Crane Library for this opportunity um, to introduce, I think, what's an important moment in American history about um, an African-American sailor by the name of Leroy, I mean, Leonard Roy Harmon. Leroy, I have that wrong? <laughs> Oh, God. Uh, um, Leroy Roy Harmon. And um, I want to thank Bob for collaborating with me on this project. I know very little military history, and he introduced um, 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 Mr. Harmon to us. And so I want to thank him for this collaboration. Let's get started. Leroy. <laughs> Okay, this is Leroy Roy Harmon, the man. And in my research, I found an interesting discussion of who he was as a person. Sometimes we know about uh, um, the historical facts. We know about what battles he fought in, and what unit of the Navy, but you don't know who he was as an individual. So I found this discussion and they said he was a big, tall guy, you know, clean cut, but you could tell he was from the Southern parts of the United States. He was from Texas, so he was country. He was both congenial and fun to be around. He didn't drink, he didn't smoke, and he was not too good on the dance floor. <laughs> he had a girl back home and she had already um, had a baby for him, Leroy II, and he was really making his way back home. That was his intention. He often didn't leave the ship because he spent his time with friends among the cooks and the other mess attendants um, on the ship. And so this is Leroy Roy Harmon. So let's talk about Roy's early life. He was born on January 21st, 1917 to Nanita White and Cornelius Harmon. Now his parents were sharecroppers because those were the only opportunities um, in the early 1900s that many African-Americans, particularly in the Southern regions of our country, those are the only opportunities that they had. 
It's a small town. It's near Quiro, uh, where he was born. And you know how small it is because today its current population is just over 8,000. And so we, he comes from a small country town outside of San Antonio. And it's, it's a few miles from San Antonio. I just wanted to give you an idea um, of the geography, the location of Quiro. And so his father would be killed tragically in 1922. And as the story was told, the sheriff in Quiro was coming to arrest Cornelius Harmon for a murder that had occurred earlier that day. Now they say that Roy's father was armed, that he had a shotgun and a pistol. But he seemed like he was gonna turn himself in when all of a sudden he shot the sheriff, shot at the sheriff. Um, he sustained a couple of um, injuries to his arm. The sheriff will leave, come back. Uh, Mr. Harmon's on his porch and he just starts firing. And so they will pretty much execute Mr. Harmon on the spot. And so this is in 1922. Roy is only five years old. Nanita has three other children. And so she's going to be a single parent raising these four children after this tragedy. She will be able to further her education and become a teacher. And she'll remarry an educator in the school she worked in. We know that Roy grew up playing sports at the Dahl School in Quiro, Texas. I think he played baseball and football at this particular school. And so this is Quiro, 1900s, around the time that Roy would have been born. I would imagine this is downtown Quiro. Uh, still, people are, um, they might have some cars there, but still people are using horse and buggy <laughs> to, to get around in Quiro in the 1900s. And so one of the main industri industries, I think Bob found this very interesting, <laughs> the main industry in Quiro was turkey ranching, was growing turkeys and sending them to market. Be previously before that, it was cattle ranching in Quiro. And so this picture shows these turkeys, I guess, going to market. It's a lot of turkeys <laughs> that are going to market. And so Quiro, Texas, you see that it's an agricultural farming community. And this is where Roy grew up. And so let's just talk a little bit about Texas. <laughs> Texas history, we know that Texas is going to be one of the states that succeed from the Union um, before the Civil War. And um, it's going to be, um, they're going to be on the side of the Confederacy. But we also, most of you, I hope, have heard of Juneteenth by now. Um, and so what's the significance of Juneteenth in Texas? And so what we know is that Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation on January 1st, 1863. And that proclamation, it did not free all 4 million enslaved people in the United States, but it did free those who were in states that were still in rebellion with the, the Union. And Texas was one of those states. <laughs> Uh, you know, Texas had not been brought under uh, um, the Union forces. And so African-Americans should have been freed in Texas on, on January 1st, 1863. But as we're told, the, the news is not brought to Texas or brought to enslaved people. I have a feeling that some of the slave owners knew that they should have been freeing their slaves. But it is the Union Army that comes to enforce the Emancipation Proclamation by June 19th, 1865. And so I found this interesting quote, it's an anonymous quote, and it says, 
we were working one day when somebody came by and told us that we were free. I think this is an enslaved person talking. And we stopped working. The boss man came up and said if he was going to knock us off the fence if we didn't go back to work. He called for his carriage and he said he was going to town to see what the government was going to do. Next day, he came back and said, well, you're just as free as I am. And so the, the, the knowledge of freedom do not come to enslaved people in Texas until June 19th, 1865. And when the soldiers come to Texas, the people of Texas are informed that in accordance with the proclamation from the executive of the United States, all slaves are free. This involves an absolute equality of rights and rights of property between former masters and slaves. And the connection here to four existing between them becomes that between employer and free laborer. That is the message brought by the Union Army Major to the enslaved of Texas. So Juneteenth Day, just want to work in a little history as we talk. Uh -huh. Next slide. <laughs> and so what was life in Jim Crow, Texas after the Civil War? Uh, after the Civil War, newly freed people are subjected to gruesome violence um, in this particular former Confederate state. The Ku Klux Klan is alive and well using lynching and white mobs against Blacks, especially Black politicians, falsely accusing Black men of rape and middle-class Blacks. Those are the targets. We have Jim Crow state regulations. Each state had their own regulations and Black codes. Those were individual codes that tried to um, put in place a strict system of racial segregation. So some of the Black codes, gave certain freedoms like you could uh, marry, but other codes said that you can't work and get a license in a particular occupation, that you could not serve on a jury, that you could not carry a gun. So different states have different black codes. And these were a strict system um, that really put in place white supremacy that continued in Southern states until the civil rights era. Blacks were relegated to working on cotton plantations, particularly in places like Texas, South Carolina, Georgia, North Carolina. Or they took up sharecropping like Roy's father did. But sharecropping will keep you in a cycle of debt that you can never get out of. Many Blacks banded together. This is an interesting phenomenon that is, it seems like it's just uh, peculiar to Texas because African Americans formed freedom colonies. They um, became self enclosed communities where they had their own churches, schools, and small farms. And so this is a photograph of African Americans in one of these freedom colonies, but there were over a hundred, if you it's probably 200. Every blue dot shows a freedom colony in Texas that they felt that they could, were not part of the larger community and they had to um, encapsulate and protect themselves by being in their own community. Um, it's an interesting, they have a Texas um, Freedom Colonies project going on and research is being done about this um, area of history. So let's talk about Harmon when he joins the Navy. Roy Harmon would have had very few options when he came out of high school, and that was to become a turkey rancher <laughs> or to become some type of sharecropping farmer. And so his, his idea was to escape that poverty by joining the Navy. And he had a medical problem, I'm not sure. I think it was a heart murmur, but I'm not sure. Um, but he was rejected two or three times, but he kept going back because this was his ticket out of poverty. He will finally enlist in the Navy and the only occupational um, opportunity for him as a uh, black man was to work as a mess attendant 
and he was third class. He was in the lower class. You got to get the second class, first class before you can get to cook uh, first, uh, third class. And so he's a mess attendant. And mess attendant mean he was doing menial type of work. He could be serving as a servant to a naval officer. He could be cleaning the floors. He could be washing the dishes. Um, so mess attendant, the only opportunity available, to, available for most uh, men who joined the Navy during that time. He did his training in Newport News, um, and he's going to join the crew of the USS San Francisco. The USS San Francisco will take him to Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1941, when the Japanese was bombing. Now, the USS San Francisco was not hit, but he'll sail on to the Solomon Islands in the South Pacific. And so let's just talk a little bit about the history of a segregated Navy. So we know the Navy has been around pretty much since the War of 1812. Um, I'm pretty sure that the Navy, um, well, African Americans are not serving in the Navy if there's one before, I mean, during the American Revolution. But it's in the War of 1812 where we have a higher percentage of African American men. And so you see this first um, image shows an African American during the War of 1812. So there were about um, 15 to 20 percent. There was a problem with recruiting Americans for this war and African-American men stood, stepped up to do that. But we know that in World War I, we will have more. And so this second image shows a sailor in World War I. But again, they're relegated to medial support roles. But the one thing the Navy did have, once you were on that ship, you were not segregated. You might be in a segregated unit as far as your occupation and your work, but you would not be segregated on the ship. But black sailors were known to fight to the end of a battle. So Roy Harmon's Navy was segregated too. After World War I, the Navy banned blacks from joining the Navy until 1932. And so, yes, they used them during World War I, and then that, then that was over. By 1940, um, this is around the time that Roy is going to be joining the Navy, there's only 4,000 Black sailors, which is only 2.3% of the Navy population. Black women did not serve in the U.S. Navy until World War II uh, in 1945 and only four served during that time. And again, I've talked about the menial positions that black sailors were relegated to. And so we know that Roy will get several promotions and he will make it to mess attendant first class when he died. So how does Roy die and why is he honored? He's on the USS San Francisco. It's part of a task force of US ships on the coast of Guadalcanal. And it's during this battle of Guadalcanal on November 12th, 1942, that 52 Japanese bombers attacked the ship. Roy and his mates were carrying the wounded out on stretchers when the ship was hit 45 times. And when a six-inch shell hit the ship, Roy yelled for his mate to take cover. And then he covered his mate's body with his own. He thereby bared the brunt of the sharpnel and the fatal wounds. Harmon was among 189 who were killed and buried at sea as a result of the Battle of Guadalcanal. And so Roy Harmon will be awarded the Navy Cross, the Navy Cross posthumously. The Navy Cross is the Navy and Marine's second highest military honor. Um, Roy and his 32 shipmates were awarded the Navy Cross for their actions on the USS 
San Francisco. And this language just talks about um, um, the president of the United States presenting the Navy Cross and what it served for as far as ec extraordinary heroism and devoted to duty and action against the enemy while serving on board the USS San Francisco. I think uh, Bob Damon is going to fill you in a little more information <laughs> about the Navy Cross. Okay. <laughs> And so we're gonna talk about a few, quickly, a few other, um, just two more um, episodes in history involving African Americans in the Navy. Doris Dory Miller, also from Texas, Waco, Texas, born to Connery and Henrietta Miller, also played sports like um, Roy did. And they're joining the Navy around the same time. They both go to Virginia for their initial training. And because of the limited opportunities for African-American men, he will also be a mess attendant third class when he enters the Navy. Um, he's going to um, initially go and, and is assigned to the USS Pyro, but he'll move on to the um, Colorado class battleship, the West Virginia. He's going to be transferred there while he's on the West Virginia, he's going to become the ship's heavyweight boxing champ. So very athletic individual. And he'll temporarily be on the USS Nevada before he's returned to the West Virginia and promoted to mess attendant second class on February 16th, 1941. And so the heroism of Dory Miller. He served valiantly, uh, valiantly, I mean that word, on the cruise of the Indianapolis in Pearl Harbor from December 1941 to May 1943, where he was promoted to cook third class. And so he got out of mess attendant class. Um, he was then assigned to the escort carrier, the Liscom, which sailed to the Pacific Islands. It's on the uh, Liscom where he will fight in the Battle of Macon. And this particular ship, the Liscom, was providing support to the Marines who are landing as they pounded Japanese air bases. But on November 24, 1943, a single torpedo from a Japanese submarine struck the Liscom. And so you have Japanese uh, attacks taking place. One of them will hit the Liscom. But at the same time that this um, torpedo hits the ship's aircraft, the bomb magazine, the magazine or the compartment holding the bombs exploded, killing over 600 sailors, including Dory Miller. And so how will Dory Miller be recognized? And so there were several bills that were introduced to award Miller the Navy's Medal of Honor. That's the highest award that you can receive um, for his courageous fighting in Pearl Harbor. But all of these con congressional bills were voted down by congressmen, including the congressmen from Waco, Texas. They did not um, agree that a African-American men should get the highest honor, the, medical, the Medal of Honor, while, while all the white sailors, all the white sailors on this ship received the Medal of Honor. And so President Roosevelt, um, overlooking how Dory Miller gave his life for his country, will award Miller the Navy Cross the second highest award, because rumors were circulating that Dory, he's a messman. How could he be shooting down planes during the attack? You know, he, he, he wouldn't have done that. But both him, Roy Harmon and Dory Miller, they might have been messmen in their positions, but when the battle started, they fought as U.S. Navy um, sailors protecting their mates and, and, and fighting back um, the enemy. And so he did not receive the highest honor like he was to. But 
We're going to finish up with a discussion of the explosion at Port Chicago in California, in the Bay Area that took place on July 18th, 1944. And basically, you have, after Roy Harmon's death, um, the Navy will increase its efforts to recruit African Americans into the Navy. Um, I think that Bob Damon will talk a little bit more about that. And so you have, at Port Chicago, you had about um, 3,000 Black servicemen that are, are working in um, this kind of dangerous position because they are loading explosives and bombs onto ships during World War II, and these ships are, are taking off active munitions that are being loaded. They are under the impression, never told, never trained how to handle these um, munitions. Let me see the next slide. And so you can see that they are um, working, loading these muni munitions. There's certain preparations that has to be done before they are put on the ship. And they are told that these are inactive um, weapons and um, never knowing the danger. Okay, back to the other slide. And so there's an explosion on July 18th, 1944. Um, it basically leveled that town of Port Chicago, California. You know, I um, did my graduate work in Berkeley and I've gone to commemorations for Port Chicago and people from Berkeley that's kind of far from um, Port Chicago, said they heard the, bar, um, the leveling of, of, um, of the town. You could hear the roar of the damage that was being done all the way in Berkeley. So it left more than 200 black sailors dead and over 100 white officers. Because in the armed services, whether it's the Army or the Navy or the Marines, it's always black units with white officers. And so after this explosion and the death of all these individuals, the white officers were allowed a 30 days survivor's leave because they had been in this explosion. While the black survivors of this disaster were told to resume their job of moving explosives. This is a um, image of some of the disaster that was uh, um, left after these bombs exploded. And so that we know that there were 328,000 that survived. And of these 328,000, when they were told to resume loading these explosives, they refused. <laughs> they were like, this just killed 200 people and we really do not want to do this job. They were forced to return to working. It was 50 of them that held out and said, no, I'm not returning. And that 50 were accused of being ringleaders of a mutiny. So they were accused of mutiny when they said, no, I will not return to this dangerous job. They will be tried and convicted of mutiny. All 50 were found guilty and they received sentences of eight to 15 years for saying, no, I don't want to put myself in this danger. Thurgood Marshall, um, who we have on this, uh, on the, in this image, a young, handsome Thurgood Marshall, <laughs> uh, filed an appeal and some of the men were allowed to go home. Just a few of them went home, but finally, on June 11th, 2019, the 116th Congress recognized and exonerated the 50 black sailors charged with mutiny, finally wiping clean the records of the Port Chicago 50. Thank you. All right, thank you, Karima. Um, so with, with that background, I think it's pretty important because the, there's, there's a really important trajectory that that, that Dr. Lewis is, has, has put out for you there. We have um, 
uh, our connection uh, to Quincy and to the Four River Shipyard in World War II is the first gentleman who she spoke about, and that's Roy Harmon. And we're going to be focusing on him um, uh, in my section of the presentation here in just a minute um, as we talk about the first warship to be named for the first and only warship during World War II to be named for an African American. Um, but before we do that, I think it's really important to understand that um, in, in the timeline or sort of the arc of experience this, that ranges from Dory Miller through um, Roy Harmon and through to the men who are working on the shore um, and in Port Chicago, um, there, there's a larger question of the evolution of the Navy and its relationship to African-Americans. And it's important to understand that up until late 1943 and early 1944, the Navy held an extremely limited view of the capacity and benefits of having African-American men in the Naval services. Um, they held a very traditional view that the only way in which African-Americans could serve in the Navy would have to be in a segregated role. And the line that was held was that it would be counterproductive to the efficiency of the Navy to try to either A, create separate segregated operations within ships or um, in separate ships, or to um, find a way to have um, integrated um, naval ships. There was the, the presumption was that that would be contrary to naval efficiency. And that was the rationale that was given up through until 1943 and would remain fairly supported by the gentleman who you see facing you right now. Um, Secretary of Navy Frank Knox was actually one of FDR's opponents in a presidential election four years before the, where the war would begin. Um, and he was part of a larger cabinet, a sort of team of rivals style sort of cabinet that FDR was trying to assemble as the war was getting underway in 1940. Uh, um, Secretary Knox was also a newspaper man, and we'll see a little bit about why that's important a little later. Um, but his lifetime career was in, was in newspapers, uh, primarily. But in May of 1943, Secretary Knox would announce that a ship would be named for Roy Harmon. And again, this is very unusual given the relationship between the Navy and African-Americans. Um, again, as Karima pointed out to you, only 2.3% um, of the sailors in the Navy in the early part of the war uh, were African-American and they were all, all limited to serving in what would be called the Messman's or the Steward's class. Um, these are not areas of the ship um, involved in combat, although they did have duties outside of their work, serving officers and caring for and cooking food for the ship. All right, so as we move forward and talk about this Quincy connection to um, uh, young Roy Harmon, um, it's good to know a little bit. I'm just going to give you a super general view of, of the basics of, of the Navy protocol for naming ships. Um, and here's just a quick outline of them. Um, carriers, aircraft carriers, which are ones that really did not appear until the 1930s, um, are named for famous battles, or they were also named for famous Navy ships. Um, later on in World War II, some would also be named for individuals as well. Um, battleships, our famous Old Mammy, the USS Massachusetts, battleships are named for states. Um, cruisers, which could often be as large or even larger than, than battleships, would be named for cities within states. We have the USS Salem, for example, right here in Quincy today. Destroyers, um, the next class down, very often named for naval leaders and, and for heroes. And then another class, a, a uniquely World War II class uh, of ships called destroyer escorts, very important ships, fast moving ships and very important ships in submarine and other kinds of tactical warfare during World War II in both the Atlantic and the Pacific theaters would be used to, to honor naval service members, so enlistees who had been killed in action. And that would be the process by which young Roy Harmon's experience is immortalized in the form of a ship 
known as the USS Harmon. The Harmon was a, a, a second iteration of the destroyer escort. It was called the Butler class. It was longer uh, than the original um, and was the most prolific of the destroyer escorts to be built during World War II. Um, the USS Harmon would be built at the Bethlehem Steel Shipyard, Four River Shipyard. And as you can see, it was built and assembled in a remarkably short period of time. And I'll be talking about that in a little bit. Um, the keel of the ship was laid down in May 5th of 1943, and the ship was launched on July 25th of 1943. So a remarkably short period of time for a ship that you see that's almost 300 feet long there. Um, the ship would be commissioned in the Four River Shipyard in August of 1943 and enter service in the, would be active in uh, service in the, in the Pacific Theater through until the end of the war and it would earn three battle stars for its participation in various actions um, in the Pacific Theater. A little bit more about the Butley, Buckley class um, of destroyer escorts briefly here. Um, a total of over 100 of them were made during World War II. Again, they were one of the, they were a very important ship. They were used primarily for quite literally escorting um, destroyers but also for all different other kinds of actions requiring fast moving ships. It was not uncommon, for example, for these destroyer escorts to be used to quite literally place themselves in between larger ships and um, oncoming enemy torpedo, for example, particularly in the Atlantic theater uh, as part of convoy escorts. These particular ships were designed for mass production so most of the, many parts of the ship would be prefabricated at factories and then brought to shipyards where they would then be assembled. Um, the Harmon was one of only nine that were assembled in the Four River Shipyard. Um, and it was assembled in a record setting pace, at a record setting pace of just 92 days. So pretty, pretty remarkable. We're gonna move on to here. Um, I'm, I'm going to uh, beg off and say that uh, our, our focus is really on Mr. Harmon today. So I'm not gonna spend a lot of time talking about Four River Shipyard, um, but many of you I saw who came on today, or many of you don't know, the Four River Shipyard, one of the largest and most productive of the public private um, shipyards in, during World War II. Um, at its height of employment, there were over 30,000 individuals working at the shipyard. Um, and they would produce 90, uh, you always get this wrong, 94, 97 ships. If Wayne Miller is listening, he will probably be rolling his eyes. Wayne Miller is one of our wonderful local historians uh, who's written a couple of wonderful books on shipbuilding uh, here in Quincy. Um, but a very prolific shipyard um, on the East Coast and one of the U.S.'s most efficient and prolific during World War II. But here we see um, images of Nanita Harmon Carroll, that is uh, Leroy or Roy's mother. Um, and she is standing, interestingly, as you can see, with two African-American members of the shipyard who are presenting her with the flowers and will present her with a bottle of champagne that she's going to use to send the USS Harmon down the ramp and into action. On the right here, you see Leroy's family, his mother and stepfather in the center and his two sisters on either side. Here, the official naval uh, uh, photographer taking pictures of the dedication of the USS Harmon. They need a holding um, and posing for the picture there. And then on the right hand side, that traditional crashing of the champagne bottle, the Great Western champagne bottle against the side of the ship to send it off down the gangway. And you can see in the picture on the right, you have two of the destroyer escorts um, and the Harmon is the one on the left. It's the one that's inboard of the two sitting there. And for those of you who are locals, you'll recognize the old Four River Bridge sitting in the background right there. So again, the Harmon would be launched and uh, assembled in a remarkable time span of 92 days. It would be launched uh, with Naunita Harmon as its sponsor.
Now, I think there's there's some interesting things that I'd like to talk to you about that are related to, to the USS Harmon that makes uh, his story a little bit interesting. Um, Roy Harmon was not like Dory Miller. He was not built like a current day NFL linebacker. As Karima pointed out, he was very much a country boy. He was not a confident dancer. He was not socially a high profile person. And Roy would not be engaged uh, in firing on the enemy in the way that Dory Miller was during the, the um, attack on Pearl Harbor. Dory would, uh, excuse me, Roy would pass away from wounds that he received by sheltering his partner, a pharmacist's mate who was carrying wounded with him. And he would die as a result of those injuries. But he was not actually engaged in battle with the enemy. His Navy Cross would be awarded for his heroism in supporting an injured uh, officer on the USS San Francisco and then on shielding a fellow uh, sailor. But he was not in the same level of action or engagement that Dory Miller had been uh, in, in Pearl Harbor. And I think that's really important because despite that fact, it would be Roy who is honored in this particular way with this, own, with this ship. Again, the only African-American for whom a, a warship would be named during World War II. Now we come back to Secretary Knox as a newspaper man. One of his strengths was his ability to get news of the Navy out across the country. And so what we see here is um, an article uh, from the Boston Globe around the christening of the ship and the dedication of the Harmon. Uh, and then over in Oakland, we have an identical picture. Um, I just had the opportunity to show two. I thought I would show coast to coast. But this same picture would be, as you can see down below on the right-hand side, picked up by the AP wire. And the launching of the Harmon really would be national news. Um, and it would appear not only um, in, in various specific segments of the media population, so not just simply in the African-American press, but it would be across uh, the press and across the, um, across the United States. And, and again, I think it's also really interesting to think about this connection between Quincy and the creation of the USS Harmon and Roy's story um, as we circle back to some of the conditions and some of the experiences that Karima, Dr. Lewis was talking to you about a little earlier in the presentation. Again, this would be the only naval warship, the USS Harmon, the only naval warship to be named for an African-American during the war. And for a long period of time, the Navy was very unpopular with African-Americans. Why? Because they knew what the Navy was doing. They knew that the only opportunity was to be a messman or a cook. And in the African-American community, the Navy, your role as a messman in the Navy was known as being a floating bellhop. Your job was to serve officers, to do laundry, to do all the other kinds of chores that Karima was talking about. Um, and so when, uh, when selective service, when enlistment really began for African-Americans in the Navy uh, in 1942 and 1943, uh, enlistment in the Army was still, would still be 10 times that of what it was in the Navy because of the very limited opportunities that would come with the Navy. Now, in early 1944, that would slow, very, very slowly begin to change. And Dr. Lewis talked to you a little bit about that. There would be an officer school. There would be a training school that was set up um, in uh, Great Lakes, Illinois. And there would be other kinds of opportunities that would open up to African-Americans outside of the Messmans or what would then be rebranded as the stewards unit. So that by the time we get to late 1944 and early 1945, only 38% of the African-Americans who are serving in the Navy are serving in the stewards units. They're serving in other kinds of units, um, mostly shorebound units, but sometimes doing coastal guard and small um, ship patrols in coastal areas. 
Those changes would be really be initiated by a small group known as the Navy Special Programs Unit. Um, and those changes would really come to accelerate rather significantly after the passing of Secretary Knox and the appointment of Secretary Forrestal as the new Secretary of the Navy. He was far more open and far more interested in seeing the Navy open its opportunities for African-American men in ways that Secretary Knox never had been. And as a part of that opening up, Roy Harmon's story and the ship named for him would become an essential part of the African-American war, war hero narrative, excuse me, during and after World War, I, World war II. And as a part of that, I think we're gonna close out um, our presentation this evening um, with this small brief segment of a um, film created in 1945, uh, in early 1945, um, called The Negro Sailor. Um, and it is a recruiting film. It is meant to be or seen to be a documentary, uh, but it's really meant to show African-American men the opportunities that they can have in this new and beginning slow, very slowly opening up the United States Navy. And so we're gonna close out with this again. Uh, and I think at the end, you will see, see why here. And he found out something else, something that opened his eyes to real teamwork, something about Stewart's mates and their place on the team. Doris Miller, Stewart's mate, first class, USN, for his distinguished devotion to duty, extraordinary courage, and disregard for his personal safety during the attack on Pearl Harbor, December 7th, 1941, the Navy Cross. Albert H. Oliver, steward's mate, first class, USN, for conspicuous gallantry and intrepidity while serving aboard a United States warship during a raid upon that vessel by approximately 25 Japanese torpedo planes in the vicinity of the Solomon Islands on June 30th, 1942, the Silver Star Medal. William Pinckney, cook, third class, USN, for extraordinary heroism while serving aboard the USS Enterprise during the engagement with enemy Japanese naval forces near the Santa Cruz Islands on October 26, 1942, the Navy Cross. Leonard Roy Harmon, steward's mate, first class, USN. For extraordinary heroism while serving aboard the USS San Francisco during action against enemy Japanese forces in the Solomon Islands area, on November 12th and 13th, 1942, the Navy Cross, a fighting ship named for a fighting man. All right, and that's where we're, we're gonna end up our conversation for tonight. So that last piece, it's really interesting. If you go to um, the Naval War History uh, website, which I'll be talking to you about a little bit later, uh, when we're doing our question and answer, you will find a set of um, trailblazers listed. You'll find Dory Miller is one of those trailblazers. Who, the person whose name you won't find, interestingly, is that of Leonard Roy Harmon. And so I think it's really interesting as we come to know and recognize these pieces and see some of these histories this interesting and very important connection. And I think that's part of why Dr. Lewis referenced this idea of the, the, the interesting pieces of this story and just telling the stories of these men um, are, are, are a real opportunity for us. Uh, and one that I've really enjoyed in collaborating with her on, on, on creating and presenting to, to share with you tonight. All right, well, um, I think we've reached the question and answer part of uh, the evening and I think uh, I did get one in the chat here, um, and it was a bit of a clarification point. The figure uh, for the workers who refused to go back, the Chicago uh, 50 slide, I think there was a um, comma that might have been off. Uh, was it 32,000 yeah. that refused to go back? Um, I'm pretty sure it was in the thousands, but I may be wrong because um, I think it was over three, um, I'll check that. 
you can ask the next question. Okay. Okay. <laughs> um, actually, one uh, question that I, thinking of the Chicago 50, I was wondering in 2019 when they um, had their records finally cleared, uh, were any still with us to to see that happen? Yeah, I think there are there were because I remember the commemoration that I attended that someone attended that and that was in two thousand maybe nine or ten. There was um, one of the gentlemen that was at this program, but I don't know how many are still living. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a shame that's so late. One. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I'll check the, the, the uh, numbers, but I, I thought it was three. It might be something else. What did I put? 300,000? Maybe I meant 3,000. <laughs> yeah, let me check that. Go ahead. Sure. Okay, Bob, I, I have another question. Um, maybe you can uh, shed some light on this. Do you have any idea? This is from Alexandra. Um, why do you think... Um, Harmon was honored with having a destroyer escort named after him, as opposed to other African American men who also distinguished themselves during World War II. Was there something special about his story that uh, made him stand out compared to others? Well, I, this this is one that we spent. I, in particular, spent a lot of time trying to find out in the archives. So I really tried to find out who who really brought forward. Um, Roy's story in a way that led to him um, having a ship name for him, as opposed to someone, again, I, I, I stopped on, on, on Dory here because he's someone who significantly is a figure, um, as in other ways, really is striking. You know, even the debate about Dory Miller was about whether or not he actually really shot down a plane when completely untrained, he picked up a 50 caliber machine gun and started shooting it. Hmm. So, um, you know, whereas Roy, Roy's story is, is much more um, inconspicuous. Um, now, part of it may be the fact that Roy is someone who lost his life in the context of his extraordinary heroism. Um, and, and so, Alexandra, that's really the, the only piece that, that he does not share with the other uh, gentlemen who are in this particular Hall of Fame in this, in this propaganda reel from 1945. Um, is that he lost his life in the context of the particular action for which he was awarded. And so that may be as simple as being quite literally a Navy um, logistics or protocol um, piece, or it may be that individuals decided that they really wanted to try to see if they could change the face of the reputation of the Navy um, with African-American men by naming the ship for Roy. Um, or it may be an intersection of both, um, but I really couldn't find any particular records, at least in the time I had to prepare for this program, um, that, that would really define or clarify that for us. So th those are the things that was, we're sort of left with. That's a fantastic question. It's certainly the main question I still come away with with regard to the story of Roy Harmon um, and, and the naming of, of the ship for him. Yeah, let me go back to the question you asked. Um, and I think I began by saying that um, there were probably over 500 that were there. And then maybe I put 3,000, 3,028, but it should be 328. 320. Okay. 328. Because I think I began by saying that there were 500 that were there at the time, 200 died. So that would leave like 328. Yeah. But I, I do my work late at night, so I do much. <laughs> uh, if I put 300,000. But in total, it was uh, 1,400 that served at um, Port Chicago. So over time, it was uh, um, 1,400 people. And uh, Dr. Lewis, I was curious. So while while researching this, did you what was the most surprising thing you think you discovered, or was there something that you discovered that wasn't included that maybe you just piqued your interest and might be another avenue for research later? That always happens. It seems like when looking into things. Yeah, yeah, it's not New England history, but uh, <laughs> which I specialize in. Um, but I didn't know the story. I'm gonna, Bob introduced me to this story. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I, I'm not someone who knows very well military history. 
you know, I do teach it in, te- in, in terms of African-American history. And so, you know, I told Bob about my father being in World War II and being in a quite distinguished unit called the Red Ball Express, um, who would take ammunition to the front lines. Now, they were not allowed to fight at the front lines, but they could risk their lives taking, moving supplies and ammunitions to the front line. And my dad was in Red Bull Express. So that's all I knew, you know, about this. And so Bob introduced this to me. But what I think I was most struck by was these freedom colonies, you know, um, that African-Americans did not feel that they could try and adapt to the larger society because of so much um, violence and segregation that they faced, that they kind of um, self-contained themselves for protection and to be able to survive. And it was like hundreds of them. Mm-hmm. And so I had no knowledge of that. I'm quite interested in learning more about that. Very interesting. Uh, uh, did you have a question, Kathy? Or yeah, oh, I, a, a comment. I was just, I was just absolutely stunned to learn about that explosion in Chicago. <clears throat> how the survivors were treated. It, I mean, the thirty days of leave for the white offices to recover from it, and 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 the black sailors go right back to it. I mean, talk about blatant. There's no even possible way to justify it. I, I was stunned. I really was. And not and only- And ashamed, did, ashamed. And Kathy, not only did they have to go back to work, but they had to clear their mates' bodies. Mm-hmm. They were ordered to clear the dead God. before they you know, resumed Unbelievable. working. Unbelievable. Um, so- uh, yeah, and then when they the fifty refused, they are arrested and put in jail. So you know the American story, but yeah, yeah. Well, you know that brings up something for me when I think of my grandfather who served in World War II and how it's such a point of pride, um, especially for white Americans for, for that service. But when you see those type of things, which is is so blatant. Um, What's the le- what's the point of is there a, still a strong point of pride for those that served even knowing that it was with this additional burden of how the greater society treated them and viewed them? Well, I can give you the example of my father who only stayed four years, and he was he was so patriotic and wanted to join this war. My father raised his age from 16 to 18, because he finished high school at 16, and he raised his age. And I have his documents where he's saying he's born uh, 1920, and I know he's born 1922. (laughs) Uh, And he became so discouraged that my father became like a civil rights activist in New York, because he was so discouraged. He stayed four years. Now his brother stayed 30, but my Mm -hmm. father couldn't take the racism. Mm -hmm. he was just out of there after the war he was gone and Mm -hmm. so I think a lot of black men had that experience you know because it was segregated units uh, relegation to the lowest my father said he learned how to peel potatoes in in, in the army you Mm -hmm. know relegated to my father was bright I mean he finished high school early but you didn't get any kind of recognition for your level of competence or or your intelligence. So yeah, it was. It's not a. It's not a um, very um, pleasant picture of our history in the military. And it doesn't change until 1948, Korean conflict, where mm-hmm. um, Truman will finally integrate the forces. It takes a while. And so I, I guess your father's brother, having served so much longer, he, I imagine, got to see quite a transition. Over that yeah, time. yeah, because he he was in um, Korea, uh, but he had he had a skill, and I don't know if that made a difference over time. He was a photographer, and I mm. think he could put that to action eventually, <laughs> you know, um, to and you know, so yeah, he had a different, but my father couldn't take it, you know, he 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 fought against uh, racism very hard. 
So, okay, not to talk about my family. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I said, like what you go down one path and it just becomes so know, interesting. You just want to hear more and more. Um, you know, these stories are, are things that um, I think a lot of people would want to learn more about or um, even make sure that the youth of today are able to learn more about that. Uh, do you have any recommendations of ways to pursue that? It's good to have these names to, you know, you can start with some of these names and start searching, I'm sure. Well, one of the best books that I use, like I said, this is not my time period. So mm -hmm. there's one particular book called Black Soldiers, The Unsung Heroes of World War II. Yep. <laughs> there you go. I go. And I found this very informative. And Roy Harmon is in this book. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so that's just a starting point. I use it to familiarize myself when I teach, you know, the later part of African-American history. So, great. Well, yeah, that's a great recommendation. Thank you yeah. very much for that. I, I would also, if I could, Paul, I would also recommend um, the Naval History and Heritage Command. So that's sort of, sort of the official archival and historical um, bureau for the U.S. Navy. Um, does a fantastic job um, in terms of telling these larger stories. Um, and so, and that, that's a website. It's rich with both um, uh, document and picture archives. Um, so it's another fantastic place to go for people to learn more about um, this history and these histories. Um, all of the individuals mentioned here are a part obviously of their records. Um, you can learn more there. Um, going back specifically, if you're interested in learning more about the Four River Shipyard, I did mention Wayne Miller, a uh, local historian uh, and on the board of the Quincy Historical Society. Mm -hmm. uh, Wayne has written a couple of books, um, one more generally about shipbuilding in Quincy, um, and then one specifically focused on the Four River Shipyard. Um, so those are some great local history resources uh, for folks to check out. Um, and then our your own facility, the Thomas Crane Library, uh, for folks who are in Quincy, um, you have access to a bunch of wonderful documents related to Quincy's naval shipbuilding traditions. Um, and there's a wonderful essay in there about the history of the Four River uh, Shipyard, uh, where folks can learn more there as well. Um, and then there's links out to um, broader resources, um, particularly across the Commonwealth, um, with wonderful images and imagery of um, ships built at Four River, amongst others. So. Um, I may have rattled those off a little quick, um, but those are just some of the resources um, that just came. And was that where you there. found this video, the the website you mentioned? Um, no, the video is something I found uh, had had dug up somewhere else. It was actually in the National Archives. So okay, the National perfect. Administration's archives are another fantastic place. Although they are a they are a significantly more challenging um, archive to navigate, I will say. Um, I, I think if you're really interested in these things, the Naval History and Heritage Command website is a really great place to start. Wonderful. Thank you for those. Um, yeah, this video, especially uh, right at the end, you know, with the context that Dr. Lewis gave and that you gave, Bob, uh, and then seeing this, I, the, the images in it, the propaganda of it, right, um, combined with how the men were treated. It, it's just kind of striking to me, you know, that they that they use the, the sacrifices to solicit people to join into the military um, and with the greater context of how society was. It, it's, it was really striking. Um, yeah. And actually, the one more thing I had, I just, I, maybe I missed it. Uh, what, what was the fate of the USS Harmon? Was it decommissioned or did it, did it get damaged in battle or? No, nope. so it would, it would, um, the Harmon would serve in the Pacific again, um, was received three battle stars. Um, so serve all the way through the end of the war. Um, it would be refitted with a new um, gun from a three inch to a five inch gun, um, uh, excuse me, millimeter gun, um, and stay, remain in service for just three, two years after the war. Um, it would be decommissioned after that. Um, and then, like many of the other destroyer escorts, um, which would be sold off, um, it eventually would be sold off uh, for scrap mm -hmm. um, in the 1960s. Um, that one remained long, a little bit longer. So the harm remained in U.S. possession um, longer than others, and it would not be sold. Many of the, the destroyer escorts were sold to Mexico, Argentina, mm -hmm. other countries looking to develop their navy. Um, and again, they were... 
a fast and very nimble ship um, and, and very easily used in a number of different theaters of, of conflict. Um, so they were uh, very utilitarian ship, for lack of a better way of saying it. Um, well, I'm not seeing any other questions in our chat, so I think we'll, we'll leave it at that. Thank you again, uh, Bob Damon and uh, Quincy 400, and of course, Dr. Karima Lewis. What a compelling program. Very, very interesting. We're so excited that you were able to present it and share it with us tonight. Thank so you. Well, thank you so much. Have a great evening, everyone. <laughs> Bye -bye. Take care. Good night, everyone. Bye.